This video is sponsored by Squarespace. The human body is capable of generating immense power. A baseball pitcher can throw a ball at over 100 miles an hour, which is just insane when you really think about it. And these guys aren't super strong, that's the crazy thing. They're not also bench pressing double body weight. It's all about using your body in the most efficient manner. And this is something that anyone can learn and understand. It's about intermuscular coordination and it's about understanding the kinetic chain and how to make the most out of it. So in this video, I'm gonna explore a little bit about what that means and how you can do the same thing. So this might be one of the most important videos on my channel. And by the time you finish watching, you will be more powerful, or at least you'll understand how to become more powerful. So let's go. So like I say, some baseball pitchers are capable of throwing a ball at over 100 miles an hour, which is just nuts. To do this, they utilize something called the Serape effect. This means that they're engaging a particular sequence of muscles which form a cross shape, an X shape, similar to a Mexican serape across the body. This includes things like the rhomboids, the serratus anterior, the obliques, and when they use these muscles together, they are able to generate that crazy power. Now the reason for this isn't because those muscles are super strong, there's not some magical property of the serape effect, it's simply because they're moving the body like this. And when you move the body like this, you're going from the top corner to the bottom corner. That's the largest cross section of the body, which means you can utilize more muscles at once to generate that power in sequence through a kinetic chain. Of course, the more muscles you use in a particular movement, the more power you can generate, as opposed to something like a curl, where you're just using your bicep, there's only so much power you can generate in that way. But of course, just contracting all those muscles at once isn't gonna do anything. You need to use them in the right sequence and in the right way. And that's what we're gonna look at here because it's a very similar method if you want to jump as high as possible. It's a very similar method if you want to throw a punch as hard as possible or throw a kick as hard as possible. This is the key to athleticism and explosiveness across the board. So to demonstrate, let's take a look at something I've been working on a lot lately, which of course is boxing. Wrong. So as you know, you don't throw a punch, as most people say, from the arm like that. This is what most coaches will tell you. Instead, you generate power from your body. You rotate your hips, your waist, you rotate your torso, and then you throw your shoulder into the punch, more like that. And it's important to keep your body relaxed and then contract at the moment of impact. I'm not the best at this by any means. Um, I just understand the theory. I'm working on my actual technique at the moment. But as you can see, I can generate a lot more power like that than I can do by just trying to muscle rather than throwing my body into it like a whip. But like I say, this advice is actually, if anything, a bit misleading. Not incorrect, but the way it's described might point to the fact that some martial arts coaches and even some sports coaches don't fully understand the actual biomechanics of what's happening. Because the way they describe it makes it sound like you're rotating your body and all the power is coming from the rotation. You're pushing off your foot. People tell you that's where the power's coming from. That's not really true. You're not simply rotating your body. Otherwise, you could keep your arm out straight like this and rotate it and that would be just as powerful, which as you can see, it obviously isn't. But if you're not using your shoulder at all and it's just rotation, you can see it doesn't really add up. So what's actually happening, let's tilt this down a little bit. And like I say, this applies to throwing and other sports as well. So don't worry if you're not a boxer or a martial artist. So instead what actually happens is I push off my foot and my hip twists. And if you watch a boxer or martial artist, what actually happens is that they move their hip just slightly before, a beat before their fist. This is already something I didn't understand when I was trying to learn because I try and throw it all at once, but actually the hip moves slightly before the rest of you. And that's important because the hip moves. And what this then does is it's created a kind of torque in my torso. It's stretched my torso by twisting it round. So my hip is now level on, but my upper torso has yet to catch up. So what happens is as the hip rotates, it creates a stretch across my torso because the hips have now rotated slightly before my upper body. So my rotating muscles, like my obliques, are now in a stretched position. They want to shorten by letting me straighten back out. This takes advantage of the stretch shortening cycle, the myotatic stretch response, which is the natural impulse of the body 
to shorten any muscle that suddenly lengthens. This can stop us from falling over, but we can also tap into it as a way to generate extra power. It's why you drop down before you do a big vertical jump. It's called a counter movement jump. You drop down into a lower position to create a stretch across that posterior chain, and then you rebound straight back up. This must be done with the right timing. If you wait too long in that stretch position, you will lose the opportunity to tap into that greater power. And it must also be done at the right length. If you go too low, or in this case, if you twist too rapidly, then you're going to lose some of that energy. Sidebar. You also sometimes see this referred to as elastic recoil, especially in regards to martial arts. This tends to refer more to the elastic properties of certain soft tissues, i.e. tendons, but I think it's more to do with the stretch shortening cycle here. After all, we're not really putting the MTUs, the muscle tendon units, into that stretched of a position. But of course, they're both kind of working in tandem here, and I may be wrong on that, but that's just my impulse. But yeah, if you hear the term elastic recoil, it's kind of referring to the same thing. Sidebar over. Actually, what you want to do is rotate the hips slightly first to create that stretch, and then the torso follows. And then this is going to happen again. The torso follows, and now the arm is left behind, creating an opening and a stretch in the pec and in the shoulder. And once again, you use that myotatic stretch response to throw it now finally into the punch. So it's kind of stretch, stretch, punch. Not rotating and using momentum, rather you're twisting the body to create stored up energy and then releasing it and punching. Another aspect to consider is that when you put the muscle in that stretched position, you're actually reaching something closer to the optimal length. There's something called the length tension relationship in muscles. It basically means that at certain lengths, a muscle is in a better position, a more optimal position to exert force and power. If your muscle is very stretched, it's too elongated, you can't exert that much power. If it's too short, you don't have enough space to exert that much power. So by getting your muscle into that optimum length, you're capable of exerting more power. And this is why it's so important to keep the body relaxed. That's the other thing that you're often told in martial arts, is to keep the body relaxed until the moment of impact. Because if you're tensed up the whole time, then you're not going to get that stretch. Because when you move, your whole body's gonna come with it, meaning that you're punching from there instead of punching from there. So in order to get that full myotatic stretch response, you need this part of your body to move loosely, kind of leaving that behind so it can then follow through and punch. This essentially makes anything like throwing a punch or jumping from a deep squat into a plyometric movement as opposed to just a strength movement. And that's where it becomes explosive versus just strong. Of course, if you're tense, you're also gonna be tensing the antagonist muscles. So in this case, I wanna punch by straightening out my elbow using my tricep. I don't want to have tension in my bicep, which will slow down the movement. So it's not only the fact that you wanna be able to get loose and kind of whip-like, but also the fact that you wanna be able to move fluidly by efficiently contracting only the muscles you want to. And this is where, again, some of the instruction given by a lot of martial arts coaches and sports coaches can be slightly misleading. When they say be floppy until the moment of impact, again, I thought it meant contract like this. So I'd be like floppy, and then just indiscriminately just tense my whole body at the moment of impact, which obviously isn't doing anything. That's not what you're doing. In fact, what you're doing is contracting only the muscles that you need to contract at the right moment. So that means contracting through the glutes and the legs and the calves to push through, then contracting the torso to rotate, and then contracting the pecs and the shoulder. So it's not so much that the whole body is relaxed and then tense, it's that you're only engaging the muscles as they're needed. So instead of thinking it as being like a floppy noodle who then just suddenly rigids up. You instead want to think about it as almost like catapulting your upper body and then launching the fist like a rocket. So the advice to not punch with the arms, not punch through the shoulder, that's also incorrect really, because the point is not that you're not punching with your arm. The point is that you're punching with your arm at the right time, once you're already in position. That tension also wants to be in the torso so that when you hit Obviously you want the torso to twist initially, but when you hit, you then don't want it to twist. So you have to become rigid and then use that anti-rotation because I don't want to be twisting back so that I can't push through. I want my torso to be rigid like a board so there's no energy leaks so I can transfer all the power through into there. So there are no weak links. And then you're just obviously going to snap it straight back immediately afterwards so that it looks nice and tidy. And like I say, when I'm doing this, it doesn't look perfect. 
because the only way to do this properly is through rote repetition. The only way to become that good at this movement or any movement, whether it's a throw or a sprint, is to practice and practice and rehearse and rehearse until you get to the point where it's second nature, because it's a coordination of multiple muscle groups working in sequence. It's intermuscular coordination through your kinetic chain. And this only comes with practice. I can't just know which muscles I need to tense in which order and then be able to do it. But knowing this does make a big difference because at least now I understand what I'm trying to achieve. When people say to me, Adam, just loosen up, loosen up when you're sparring or whatever, being loose on its own has no benefit if you're not utilizing that looseness correctly. You need to be able to utilize it to whip and twist your body so that you can generate that stretch, that stored up energy, and then release it. If you're just loose, but you still don't know how to punch, that's not going to help you at all. So now you understand what you're trying to do, you can then use that same principle, whether you're throwing a roundhouse kick, whether you're throwing a punch, whether you're throwing a ball, it's the exact same thing with a ball. The shoulder comes forwards first, creating that nice stretch so that you can then utilize not only the muscles in your lats and your shoulders, but also the muscles on the other side of your torso, in your legs, to generate maximum power all in the right sequence. In sports and athletics, this is sometimes referred to as the double pulse. The double pulse being the relaxation followed by contraction. But I again find that to be a little bit misleading because as you can see, there's much more than just two pulses going on here. It's actually a double pulse all the way up through your body. Double pulse in the hips, double pulse in the torso, double pulse in the shoulder, double pulse even in the fist, which also should be contracted. Just another sidebar here to say that the double pulse actually is a contraction, a relaxation, followed by a contraction. Uh, but that doesn't really alter the fact that I think this is more of a cascade of relaxations and contractions that travel from the bottom of the body up to the fist or however they travel for whichever movement you're executing. Sidebar over. So I prefer to think of it more like a ripple effect across a pond. The pond being your muscles, the ripple being the contraction. So the contraction should spread in this case from the bottom of your body, from your legs, all the way up through into your fist at the end before you pull it straight back. And this understanding should also hopefully enable us to slightly better understand how we can train for this because simply doing bench press isn't going to be enough to make you punch harder or run faster. Likewise, just doing squats isn't gonna be enough to maximize your jump height. There will be some carryover, but there's more that we can do because in a bench press, for example, you're just pushing all of your might, grinding it through the motion, keeping your torso rigid, so instead, if we do something like one-armed push-ups, here we're training ourselves to keep our torso rigid at the same time as our body, which is what teaches us to use that anti-rotation at the same time as the pushing movement when we're in this position, which might be why Bruce Lee liked one-armed push-ups so much. If we want to make even more use of this, then we can try lying on the ground in a relaxed position in the one-armed push-up position, and then forcefully, suddenly, bursting out of it, which is hard to do, maybe even leaving the ground if you can. If you want to take this even further, you could even raise your arm on a platform or on a ball or something so that you're pushing from that stretched position. And then you can try dropping into that position and using that myotatic stretch response. Explosive push-ups can be useful, although you don't have that rotation in there. If you want to train rotation, doing things like med ball rotational slams can be useful. When it comes to jumping, likewise, doing things like depth jumps where you're purposefully dropping down then leaping up as soon as possible, can again make a big difference. Another way we can train the double pulse, that relaxation and contraction, is by using kettlebell swings. These are particularly useful if you want to learn to jump higher, of course, because that's the movement pattern you're emulating here. With a kettlebell swing, you go from relaxed and then you thrust the hips to suddenly explode forwards or upwards, which is exactly what you do when you're doing a counter movement jump. This is just another reason that kettlebell swings are so powerful and have that what the hell effect. That's how you train your body and it's how you move your body to utilize the maximum amount of power in any given movement pattern. I hope you found this useful and interesting. I love this stuff. This is why I like martial arts, not because I wanna kick someone's ass, but because I love understanding the body and how to maximize power, grace, fluidity, agility. I just think it's incredible what we're capable of when we put our minds to it. If you also find this stuff really interesting, then you might like my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training 2.0, the protein performance system. The ebook portion is 85 plus pages of this kind of in-depth nerding out stuff. And then I 
take all of it and put it into a training program that you can do anywhere with any amount of equipment at any level of expertise. So if you'd like to try that out, then head to the link in the description down below. And uh, yeah, either way, thank you so much for watching this one. Let me know what you think about all this and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. So guys, this video was sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace, as you probably know by now, is a website building platform that makes it extremely easy for anybody to build their own website. In a matter of minutes, literally, it only takes minutes. That's because it makes it extremely simple with a very intuitive drag and drop system for designing your website. You can start with a template, if you like, that's provided by Squarespace. They've got tons to choose from. Then you have to just do a little bit of tweaking to get it exactly to your liking. And then you can use all of the advanced features that come with Squarespace. There's advanced formatting tools for creating beautiful blog posts and scheduling them for later or publishing them. You can share it with your social media followers very easily, thanks to social media integration or directly share your posts to your website either way. There's a fully integrated commenting system with threaded comments, replies and likes, member management, easy revenue generation thanks to members only gated content. Of course, you've got e-commerce and everything that comes with that so you can sell products from your site. And then it's endlessly expandable thanks to a nearly limitless supply of plugins, both from Squarespace themselves and from the community. For example, if you want to expand your e-commerce then you've got things like global tracking, inventory management, tax reconciliation, everything that you could need and pretty much everything else. This is why many of the biggest brands on the web use Squarespace, as well as many, many people who are just starting out and want to create a website for a hobby. So whichever category you fall into, I highly recommend them. If you want to find out more, then go to squarespace.com. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Bioneer for 10% off your first website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Thanks to you guys for watching. And bye for now.